Tonight we're continuing in the third chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 37th lesson. <coughs> well, really, I don't like that word lesson, but that's for want, for want of another word. <coughs> now to me, One of the things that's very necessary to see is that salvation involves more than extricating us from a state of condemnation. Our justification and the remission of sins are absolutely necessary. Make no mistake about it. But both of them are introductory. They're a prelude to what God's doing. They position the people so God can work in them to will and do of his own good pleasure. Now, Paul knows that a couple of things are required here. First, the people of God must be taught sound doctrine. Now, that, that's essential. And that's what Paul's doing. He's teaching sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is doctrine that is solid, and it's not punched. Punch, you can't punch through it, find weaknesses in it. It's solid, conforms to the truth. Doctor means teaching. <coughs> so Paul now informs the Ephesians that he not only has been proclaiming this, now he's... He's praying about this. Why? Well, because preaching has got to be done, teaching has got to be done, but so does praying. Yeah. Amen. It's important that the people who hear comprehend. Amen. And people that are taught grasp it. Yeah. It's important. Now you can teach it, you can preach it, but now when it comes to them comprehending it, now that <laughs> we got to involve yes. Amen. heaven now in that, yes, in that matter. Yeah. And there are things that won't happen unless we earnestly seek them from the Lord. They just that's just the way things are ordered in the kingdom of God and in salvation. God has arranged things so that He hasn't excluded Himself. He's <laughs> He's got to be involved in the process. If he's not, it's just a lot of vanity. And I'm just so afraid that a lot of what I have seen of a church activity, it's just God's not in it. As far as I'm concerned, it's just a waste of time. People must be in a constant process of gaining knowledge and having strength to implement it. God isn't developing people just know a lot of things. These facts that we know that faith lays hold of, they are like indexes to God, like a table of contents of God embodied in Christ. And the way the kingdom of God works is the more you know God, the more he involves you in his process to your benefit. He can involve you for other reasons too, but we won't dwell on that. Now Paul wants the people to have a good grasp of what he's been saying. But he's got to, it's really got to go further than that. And that's what we're going to see tonight. He begin to pray another one of his prayers. Now these people, keep in mind, are noted for their faith in Christ and love of the brethren. We, so these are not like disinterested people that he, he's praying for. These are not people that have made no progress that are like the Laodiceans. It's not like that. These people have been making some progress. But thoughtful men should be able to reason this out now. 
that for God to make the kind of investment he's made in salvation, there's got to be a lot that comes from it, or God wouldn't have made this, big, this large of investment. He not only has sent his son, he subjected himself to a great deal of grief over having to smite his own son and awakening his sword against the shepherd. This, I speak as a man because this is out of a category of understanding, but this must have been a sorrowful thing for God to do. God isn't thinking he delight in the death of the wicked. You can imagine he didn't take delight in the death of his son. Amen. It's the results of it that drove him to do it. So the thoughtful man should be able to reason out. That, but, but see, they don't. There aren't this many. There aren't many thoughtful men. At least not in our location. I'm I'm constantly impressed with the shallowness. Sometimes this is uh, almost more than I can bear. I sometimes think if I had the authority, I would isolate these men in an island someplace in a Timbuktu and get them out of society because they are a great hindrance to the body of Christ. Non-thinking people are a big hindrance, large hindrance. Because they make dumb people look smart. And they hide the truth of God from people. Now you'll notice how provocative to your mind what Paul has been saying is. You, you picked up on this. I know you have. That your mind kind of cranks up two or, three <laughs> two or three notches as you begin to consider these things. What I'm saying is that's how it's supposed to be. Because if your mind's involved in it, this brings every other part of you along, along with it. Now, Babylon the Great has produced a kind of thinking that basically inhibits spiritual development. That's what they do. If a person has a desire to grow and they get swallowed up in Babylon, pretty soon the desire goes like this. And they look like they they look like they're further along than they are because they're comparing themselves with these other people. So you compare yourself with Paul, you don't feel like that. <laughs> That's why God did this. God pours out a lot on another person who looks like just another, just like a member of the human race. But he pours this out on him to provoke. Jealousy, godly jealousy, we're talking about. To provoke godly jealousy among the other people. Because in Adam, see, we're all, there's a kind of a level playing field in Adam. But here and there, he pours out this tooth to let you know the potentiality of men, particularly in Christ. Now, anything that makes a person content to be fundamentally ignorant of God and Christ. Like this leads to the lake of fire, people. Yeah, right. uh -huh. Uh -huh. When Jesus comes, he's going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Amen. Hmm? Amen. That's how serious this is. Right. Amen. People who don't know God are going to be damned. Amen. God doesn't delight in it. We don't delight in it. Right. But this is just a fact in the case. He's revealed this is what's going to happen. God desires this knowledge of God to proliferate through men. All right, Paul's in the middle now of opening up a certain facet of this. We're going to deal with the last part of the 16th verse, 316, the last part of it, and the 17th verse. To be strengthened, well, I'll read all of the 16th verse that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. How's that for, how's that for specificity? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that 
Ye being rooted and grounded in love. Then we're going to stop there. That, 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 in order that. See, in other words, one thing leads to another thing leads to, this is growth. This is what growth is. One thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. This is growth. This is advancement Amen. in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's praying this. This is a prayer. He's praying that they'll be strengthened. See, you got to be strong to be in Christ. And for Christ to be in you. His call requires strength. Supernatural strength. Miraculous strength. That's how serious it is to be in the body. This, this body. <laughs> now remember the thing that's driven his prayer is the fact that God is showing principalities and powers in heavenly places his manifold wisdom by the church. That being the case, he's praying this. Who's he got in mind? Your neighbor? No. Does he have the world in mind? No. He's got those principalities and powers in mind. It's too easy to impress the world. Not quite so easy to impress Gabriel and Michael and brother principalities and powers. It's not quite so easy to impress them. But God's doing it through the church. He's teaching them. Through the church, by the church. His manifold wisdom. God wants angels and principalities and powers to know how exceedingly wise he is. Amen. He let Moses see how corrupt people could be. Yeah. Yeah. Moses couldn't do anything about it. He let the prophets see how corrupt humanity is, how that every imagination of the heart is only evil continually. There isn't anything they could do about it. But something does have to be done about it. It's not that, no, we just can't do anything about it. No, we've got to pray. We're going to pray about this. Because what God is doing is bigger than what people suspect. There's too small a thought about the work of God. And what God's doing. People have small pygmy thoughts about that. Like that God really wants the very best for you in this world. That's such a small thought's unworthy to be uttered. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The purpose of God is, well, some people think of God only when there's a crisis. That's when they think of God. But that's not, that's not what God is targeting. Now here notice, he's praying that, uh, I like these first two words of, of what to deal with, to be. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be. Other verses read that you may be. The idea here is of altering the capacity of a believer to be. What you are is infinitely more important than what you do. He says, I'm praying that you may do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, That's not what he's praying. That you may be. It's something like God prefigured this with King Saul. Samuel told him, you're going to become another man. Amen. That's 1 Samuel 10, 6. 1 Samuel 10, 9 says, God gave him another heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Saul's not like the ex example for us to follow. 
but that part of it is sort of a prelude to what salvation is all about. Salvation is not about getting you to do the right thing. We understand that's necessary. We understand it's good, but that's not what it's all about. It's that he's, he's targeting making you be something, become something, possess certain traits. All right, what is it going to be? To be. See, now we're out of the realm of philosophy now. Everybody understands this. When you say be, all right, you're out of the realm of philosophizing now. Yeah, amen. We're talking about something that really happens here. Right, yeah. Not something that should ha happen, not something that can happen, something that really takes place. To be, to be strengthened. Now, I remember we're talking about people that have believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they've had faith, they have love of the brethren. He prayed that they be strengthened. Actually, they'd be, by comparison, they'd be strong as compared to other people. But as compared with God's purpose, they needed to be strengthened. Some versions say, make you strong, strengthen power, enable you to grow firm in power, empower you, be strengthened and reinforced. This word strengthened, means to be made stronger, to increase in strength and grow strong. Are you strong? Would you say you are strong? I think some of you are strong, but you're not that strong. You're not exempt from prayer like this. Be strengthened. Amen. So in other words, we're not in a fixed state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Some people think we are. Uh -huh. yeah. Some theology states that we are in a fixed yeah. state. Uh -huh. And I don't hear many people dealing with this. Mm. They'll say things like, you can fall away, which is true. But I mean, is this really our message? You can fall away. I like to please have something a little better than that to have to say. I've been praying. Not that you won't fall away. That's not what he's praying. Even though he did, he did not desire that they fall away. But he, he goes to more to the foundation. I'm praying you be strengthened. In other words, the storm's growing worse. The environment around you is getting worse. This, the winds are beginning to beat. The storms are beginning to... See, this is how the life of Christ is. You proceed into a storm. That's, how, that's what this is. The storm's eventually going to be the, being the decimation of the earth. It's, it, when the storm's over, there isn't going to be any more heaven and earth as they are. So, but the storm is, is beginning now. Uh, this, is, this is the description of him with whom we have to do. That's it's right. Not just, it's not just the world, <coughs> the earth, and the enemy of our soul. Amen. God. Amen. Prepare to meet your God. Now, that <laughs> seems simple now, doesn't it? I mean, it seems real obvious now. But I can remember when, like, that wasn't all that obvious yeah. to me. Once I once I saw it, I wonder why why haven't I seen this? You know, because it it fit right together with what I what I understood. But this that he's this is he's saying these things. That's he's writing these things down, so they can be pondered, <clears throat> strengthened. Now this is not a passing strength like Samson. He was strong at times. <laughs> At times, the Spirit of God came upon him and moved. He became strong. Supernatural strength. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about being strong for like the evil day. Or being strong for a special test. That's not what we're talking about here. 
And he's going to tell you why he'd be, be strong. It's not going to be for that reason. <coughs> this is a condition for which he prays. This condition for which he prays will be directly proportionate to what the Ephesians can perceive of God's glory. The weaker they are, the less they'll perceive it. The weaker they are, the less Christ is going to be in them. This is what's going to be. This is what's, that's what we're going to be dealing with. I pray you might be strengthened. That is with might. <laughs> with might. Yes. Before you move off that point, I was considering strengthening in a picture in the body that we see that the body is strengthened after it is tried in a certain area, yeah. broken in a certain area, Good. then the strength is returned and it's stronger than Good. afterward Good. than it was before. So this strength is going to try every aspect of our person, Amen. Our, our life, every aspect of it, so that every part can be built up and strengthened Amen. to this end. Good. Amen. Amen. It's furnace strength. <laughs> furnace strength. <coughs> with might. Other versions say with power. Now the academic definition is strength, power, ability. Oh, I see that, that stretches it out a little bit more. Inherent power. Not power that comes on you. You you become strong. See, there's a difference between that and then kind of a strength that comes on you for a specific task, like, like Samson and the Philistines. Inherent power, power residing. So the power's not going to swoop down, do the work, just go back. It, the power's going to come and stay. That's the kind of power we're talking about here. And it's supernatural in nature. <clears throat> this is miraculous power. Power that gets things done that can't be done. Outside of divine intervention. You'll be strengthened with might. Not with uh, the ability to fake your, fake your way through the thing. Some people can like fake their way through trouble and yeah. Put on a smile and you can't tell anything particular is happening. That's not what we're talking about here. That kind of there is that kind of strength. I mean that's that's not illegitimate strength, but that's not what we're talking about here. With might by his spirit. Oh now. Oh now with the administrator of this strength. You don't read this strength into yourself. You don't study this strength into yourself. You don't pray this strength into yourself. This is administered by the Holy Spirit. And he has no known limitations. Amen. That's the means. He's going to make it effectual. The smite is going to become effective in the person. Knowing the criticality of this, you got to have this power, this smite, and the Holy Spirit is administrating it. Now it makes sense. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Amen. Quench Amen. not the Spirit. See, that makes perfect sense now. This is the case. You don't want to put a bottleneck on what he's doing. And say that he's a master. He's a bottleneck master. Amen. He creates bottlenecks. Turn the eye someplace else. Veer just slightly off course. He's a master getting people to do this. And when they do this, they're out of range of the might and the power. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he's the one that washed us, sanctified us, and justified us. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 11. You are washed, you're sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Showing you here that he's instrumental in this, what God's doing. He's an indispensable worker. So we don't seek to grieve him. He enables us to wait for the hope of righteousness. We wait for the hope of righteousness through the Spirit. See, that requires some kind of strength to be able to hold on to your hope when things look hopeless. <laughs> 
when you don't have a lot of answers. So hold on to it. He renders us capable of obeying the truth. We obey the truth through the Spirit. All right, that's the Spirit that's going to administer this might that Paul's praying about. But he's going to put it in the inner man. That's where he's going to put it. Not going to put it in your arm your, or your head or your feet. It's in your inner man. Strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's uh, synonymous with the inward man. That's where we delight in the law of God in the inward man. Romans 7.22 says, this is the unseen part of the redeemed, this renewed day by day. We are renewed day by day in the inward man. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. So he's, that's where the might's going to be, in the inward man. So if you live only with the outward man in mind, you don't get any of this. That's just the truth of the matter. Somebody's got to say it. You don't get any of this. You have to put on the inward man and the new man. It's the same thing. You got to put on the new man or you don't know anything about strength, power, ability, capacity. This is all beyond you if you don't put on the new man. Or revelation in the scripture that the Holy Spirit will work in anybody that doesn't have a new man. That's right. He, does, he works in the new man. You know. So a person in Christ, there isn't any question about whether he has a new man. Put on the new man. To be more, really more precise, he doesn't work in anyone who doesn't put on the new man. That is, you have to live under his domination. You have to pay attention to what he's doing. You have to live in the newness of life, walk in newness of life. Amen. If you don't, none of this applies. Secondly, with might by his spirit of the inward man. That's whatever is born of God. That's what Paul John is saying. Whatsoever is born of God. That's, that's what he's talking about here. Not just talking about the, inv the invisible part of your being, like your soul. That's, a, that's not what he's talking about. This new creation is not sufficient of itself. The new man's not sufficient of himself. Got to be strengthened. Okay. The new man always does this, the new man always does that. That's not even the that's not even the point. The point is your recept your response to him is putting him on. That's the point. I understand that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not. But a person who doesn't put him on will sin all the time. Yeah, that's how serious this is here. We're talking about. The new creation is not sufficient of itself. It's a, it's a growing creation, not a static creation. Right, like the sun, moon, stars, they're, they're static creations. They don't increase in their light. They just, it's like fixed. But that's not the way the new creation is. New creation is not like that. It grows. Now why? Why does he, why does Paul pray that God would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. Maybe it's so you can do better works, do good works, be more consistent. Oh, that's not it. Not here. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Amen. This is the Christ that's made known in the gospel. The gospel of Christ. That's the Christ. So that Christ may dwell in your heart. A lot of people say, well, I received Christ into my heart. Of course, that language isn't in Scripture. But all right, let's, let's, let's acknowledge that receiving Christ isn't the point. It's Christ staying that's the point. That Christ may dwell, that means permanent. See, does that mean... 
He does it sometimes. Well, if you're not strong, yeah, that is what it means. Amen. Christ is too big and Christ is too potent and Christ has too much power to stay in a weak person. Strengthen you with might by his spirit of the inner man that in order that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Now remember, he's praying that the principalities and powers, yeah. heavenly places, might be shown the manifold wisdom of God. All right, let's see the, the, the principalities and powers look down upon earth, and they see these vacillating up and down, in and out, inconsistent people. Does this display the wisdom of God? No, this does not display the wisdom of God. If that's what this is all about, the angels are probably saying, do you want us to call, do you want us to send some fire down there? That's not what this is about. People are saying, I can't do anything, it wasn't me, it was God, and so forth like this. It used to sort of irritate me. Someone would deliver a good message, you know, and you say, oh, I wanted you to know what that is, how that is. It wasn't me, it was the Lord. What kind of talk is that? Paul said it was me. I'm the one that did the living. I'm the one that did the speaking. I did it by the grace of God, but I'm the one that did it. I did it. Amen. That displays God's wisdom, you see. There's unsearchable riches that are to be enjoyed. <coughs> I, it's a difficult thing to actually express. Yes. When you talk about somebody's uh, owning, as it were, the, the message, you're actually declaring that there's not a disconnect between that, you and God. It, as well, yes. Uh, I mean, people can, they, <coughs> they heard the voice. Yeah. They saw the person speaking, but then you're making a connection in... in um, you're you're not saying it was just you that did it. the The point is is that it was you by the direction of God, but that you yourself have embraced what it is that yeah. you said. That yeah. you're identified with what you said. It's not as though you're a a, a horn or a, you know some kind of uh, some kind of instrument Robot, that yeah. that something came through like a like a hose and water goes through it, but it doesn't become water. It's still a hose whenever the water's turned off. It's it's more like a, a melding <laughs> of right. the two. So that there's, it, it was a message that originated with God, but you yourself have partaken of it. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the husband must be first partaker of yeah. the fruit. Mm -hmm. So you're proclaiming things that you yourself are saying, these things are true. I have agreement with them. They're worthy Amen. to be received. Mm -hmm. See, people people talk a lot about Christ shining out through you and Christ being seen in you and Christ working through you. And these are all proper perceptions. But for Christ to work in you, he's got to live in you. And for Christ to live in you or dwell in you, you got to be strong. Amen. Amen. Hey, now this is not generally known. Uh -huh. yeah. Because, because it, it's plain enough from what, what we're reading here. It's plain enough. But see, this is not the type of thing that is being heard in our day. So for Christ to, Christ may dwell, take up present residence, and then... That's when he does this work. Sister Jude is talking about that's It's the indwelling Christ that produces this, but Christ can't dwell in weak inner people yeah. who their inward person is fundamentally weak. Mm -hmm. And if it's not strengthened with might by his spirit, that is the situation. And there's no deficiency with the Holy Spirit like you've already said. So if there's something, if a person's weak, they, they've actually, through disinterest or, or some other means, they've interrupted this yeah. process. See here, when God, when there's a new creation, God creates a new creation, that 
new creation can't stand on its own two feet. That's the thing that has been, that has eluded many people. It's dependent upon God. Yeah. Well, all, all in this hostile yeah. environment. That's, right. that's it. That's it. You mm -hmm. know, it's constantly being drained and working. Mm -hmm. And if you're out there, you know, if you're out there and, and you and you engage and you're in the fray, mm -hmm. you know, that's so right. then you're gonna you're gonna need your resources gonna be used. Yeah, Gotta be strengthened with for Christ to reside. You've got to have Christ living in you. Mm -hmm. But Christ can't live in you unless you're strengthened with might by His Spirit. See, Paul knows this. He's praying this. Yeah. It seems to me that <coughs> he pretty much knows that even though once you know this, you can kind of put it together in his teaching, that this has probably eluded the Ephesians. So he's praying this. He's told them about Christ being in you, and you've received Christ and this sort of thing. But now he's, he's praying that they can see this, that if, for Christ to stay. <laughs> All right, that... That requires some strength from the Lord. He might dwell in your hearts, take up his residence in your heart. Now, he's told us doctrinally that the church is being prepared for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I mean, he's kind of told you that deity being merged with humanity, that is kind of the point behind it all. But for that to happen... Jesus was made weak to die, but he will not be made weak to dwell. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Jesus won't humble himself to live in you. Yeah. Yeah. He humbled himself to die for you, not to live in you. Why? Because you can't be saved by a humbled Christ. Yeah. You're saved by a reigning, ruling Christ. Yeah. And Jesus won't stay where he doesn't reign. Amen. So people say, well, I, I th feel I should give myself more fully to the Lord and so forth. I understand what they mean, and this is true. But this is answering that problem. See, that's may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, I want to draw special attention here to the miserable translation of the Message Bible. It's called a Bible. Here's how this verse reads in the Message Bible. That Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. That's how it reads. This is the Bible some people use. That's not what it means. If that's what it was, he would have told the people. Open the door and let him in and invite him in. But he prays to God <laughs> that God will strengthen you by his spirit so that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. It once becomes very obvious that Jesus coming into the heart is not the point. But it's a scripture to say to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. This is John 1.11. But Jesus remaining and taking up his abode in men, that's the thing that that will enable God to teach principalities and powers to show him his manifold wisdom by the church. That's the yeah. but for this to happen, they've got to be strengthened with might by his spirit of the inner man. Now you kind of see this at the word. Jesus deals with the church at Laodicea. He's outside the church knocking on the door. That's the opposite of strengthened with might by his spirit and the inner man so Christ may dwell in your heart. That's the opposite. This was a real church. But here Jesus on the outside. Why was it? Because they hadn't done this and they hadn't done that and they hadn't done the other. No, they had not been made strong by the Holy Spirit because they were the kind of church the Holy Spirit couldn't work with. Uh -huh. Yes. Wherever Christ dwells has to be prepared. For That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Considering, considering even his earthly body 
had to be prepared mm -hmm. for him. That was like a picture of what we're seeing That's now. Right. That the inner man also has to be prepared for him. Amen. Mm -hmm. And remember when he was going to occupy the institute, the Lord's table, he prepared a Amen. prepared a special place yeah. for that. Prepared. To the world says he grew. Yes. He, he grew. And the the body grows. The the uh, constitution of the what we call the new man mm -hmm. is union with God. Yeah, that's right. And if that union doesn't exist, then the new man ceases to exist. Amen. It's the old man then. That's the right. old nature without God and without hope in the world. So but this strengthening is for this process of growth and influence. That's right. Amen. It's all, it's, it's there. Amen. It's not fully developed. And Amen. You have, and you have the influences of the, of the old nature that are being crucified and denied and, and uh, thrown down, subjected at, as the new man grows and matures. And the presence of Christ becomes more evident. And you see, a person who has walked with the Lord and has grown in faith, it's not as hard to see Christ in them as perhaps when they first yes. came into the kingdom. Amen. Mm -hmm. And because it's it's more evident what what they are becoming in Him. I am I am more and more impressed with how becoming initiating newness of life is equated with having everything that that starting the race somehow is equated with finishing the race it, and people are such like they've assumed some doctrines that if you can just start the race you're guaranteed you'll finish it and this they don't actually say it in those words but they have, that's what they're saying yeah. but see this is all telling you no this isn't the case when the, when the work is initiated if you get high enough yeah god will perform the work but he won't depart <laughs> from his agenda to do it. This is where Christ could do no mighty works. That's right. He couldn't stay there. That's right. That's right. So Christ remaining, see this punches a hole right through the theology that says the Great Commission. That's just punches a hole right through that. Shows though this isn't, the, this isn't, this is the beginning. And it's got to be brought to culmination. For the thing to be brought to culmination involves more than God telling you what you need to do. That He does do this, but now you. But even even that is, if Christ isn't dwelling in you, it doesn't make a difference how you do things. It's got to be done in the power of Christ, and Christ dwells as you're strengthened by His Spirit in the inward man. Otherwise, he busts the walls down. That's the way it is. Christ is too big. Yeah. Too big and too potent. So it becomes obvious that this is why Paul said, he said, now come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now they were already, they were new creation. The very next chapter, and very, very preceding chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, that was 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 5 said they were, they had, they were a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And he says, and I will receive you. This means everything hasn't been locked in place yet. When, you, when you're born again, everything's not like locked. In. You're at this point here, and, and now the, the interlocking begins and for this to happen for us to be one spirit yeah. and for Christ to eff effectively dwell within requires this power that he's Amen. he has to pray about this Amen. there's something to be seen in the fact that no one has made a fully mature um, believer the moment they believe that's right so the, the purpose of God is being realized in the growing up into Him. Amen. In, in all things. There's there's something that the Lord that has to to take place in that in the growth process mm -hmm. that is being realized. 
Amen. In other words, salvation is not creating just like another segment of angels. Yeah. Right. Yes. He could, he could create, you know, just, just by let there be. Mm -hmm. But in Christ, there's this, over this period of time, he's creating mm -hmm. a, a creature. Amen. Amen. And that's that's the wisdom that's being made. That's right. What's required to bring that, that's, that's the wisdom that's being made known. I think another big aspect of that is what the point that you made earlier about the principalities and powers and heavenly places watching this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's in that they're, yeah. they're learning something That's right. that Amen. requires this growth process. Amen. There's a custom aspect. Anytime you fit something to something else, it's a custom work. And it's, yes. it's so it's so unique in each each one of the, his body, each member of his body, that I can see why it's a spectacle because it's yes. a special custom fitting. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so you were gonna say something? Okay. So there you have he would strengthen you with might by his might with might by his spirit. In the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart. Now here's another layer, yeah. by faith. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now it stands to reason if this is the case, faith has everything to do with this growth, yes. advancing posture. Because this, the wisdom that's displayed to principles and powers will not be seen in people starting a race. It's seen in them advancing, mm -hmm. being willing in the day of his power, advancing it out of preference, and growing in Christ, Christ remaining with them. When he didn't remain in Bethlehem, he didn't remain in Nazareth, he didn't remain in Cana. <laughs> right. But he does remain in these people. Uh -huh. That's caught their eye. Yeah. Amen. That's caught their eye. <laughs> See, the indwelling Christ is not to be assumed. Because he dwells in our heart, a strong heart, that's been strengthened by might, by his spirit. He dwells in that heart, but he dwells by faith. So as faith enhances, the indwelling is more secure. Faith diminishes, the, in, the indwelling is less secure. Because it's by faith. That's, that's the uh, governor. <laughs> that's the governor that regulates the whole thing. It's your faith. And your capacity is determined by the power that the Holy Spirit ministers. See, strengthens you with might by His uh, strengthens you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That's the thing that makes the capacity, and faith is the thing that determines the rate. You might say of increase. Now that you got another one of these that's here. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. So now we come to the aim of Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. This is from our vantage point, which is in order that they might be taught the manifold wisdom of God. In order that we being, there you are, the being again. Not doing, being. You can see this now, I know, but... Maybe you can recall when you when you thought of doing more than of being. But you notice how much we're addressing being something. Other verses read, you may be or because you've been or having been or you have, you must be, you may you be. See, it's what you, it's something you, you be, you become. Being. There's a vast difference between being and doing. Both are necessary, but in Christ, doing depends solely upon being. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I just like to say it. I just <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Doing depends upon being. So some people, they really can't do. <laughs> so you can exhort them, you can thump them on the head, you can beat them up, but they can't do because they aren't, they don't have the right be. 
That's why the plowing of the wicked would be sin. That's right. But Dad, the, amen. But the plowing of the righteous isn't. Amen. <laughs> now, Paul has labored to identify what we are in this epistle. He's told us that you are faithful, you're chosen, you are predestinated. See, this has to do with the are, what you are. You are predestinated, you are accepted, you are sealed, you are enlightened, you're quickened, you're raised and seated, you're his workmanship, you're made nigh, you're fellow citizens, you're built. See, that all has to do with what you are. <laughs> According to the letter of the Ephesians, to this point, things that we do or have done are fewer in number. On all those things, up to the, what we are now, we've, it is said that we trusted. That's something we did. And it said you believed. That's something we did. Yeah. But that's about it. All the rest is what we are. Amen. Has to do with being. The accent's clearly been placed on what we are in Christ, not on what we do. Even though it, this doesn't suggest, we surely we don't, want, we don't have to say this, but do, this doesn't suggest that doing is not important. It just suggests that being is the most important. Yeah. Because you can do a lot of stuff and hear the words, I never yeah. knew you. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> In order that you might be rooted and grounded. Some versions read rooted and that'd be plant and established, that'd be building. Rooted and based, rooted and founded, rooted and firmly established, the ground into which you sink your roots, planted and built. Your roots will grow down and with both feet firmly planted. The idea is solidity, dependability. Now, some of the versions miss the point, I think, very much so, representing the text as though it was an exhortation to be grounded. It's not an exhortation to be grounded. There are texts that deal with it from that standpoint, but that's not, not this one. This has to do with divine objective. Whatever you may think of unrooted and ungrounded and unstable Christians and vacillated Christians, whatever you may think about them, and we don't just like to rule them out. We understand that there are some people that are that way, but they, salvation is not calculated to keep you that way. Yeah, right. Salvation is calculated to get you out of that inst unstable, not knowing what to do, you're not sure who you are, and it's all of this sort of thing. That this, these conditions exist. We don't, we don't deny that. Yes, they do exist. But now we're talking about what God intends. God intends to teach these principalities and powers in, manifold, in heavenly places His manifold wisdom by making these people strong through the Holy Spirit, so Christ can dwell in them by faith, so they can be rooted, wind and blow down. Grounded. When the winds beat upon the house, it doesn't fall. See, that's that's what this all the process that's involved in this. That's where divine wisdom is being made known. Amen. In that happening, mm -hmm. that makes uh, makes it known. Mm -hmm. While the implications of this text are rather alarming, it. It seems we, we ought to consider them. Where professing believers are not rooted and grounded, it is because Christ isn't dwelling in their hearts by faith. And if Christ isn't dwelling in their heart by faith, it's because they haven't been made strong That's right. by the Holy Spirit. They haven't been strengthened by the Spirit, which means they, they had to, got to have quenched the Spirit. That's right. I don't, I don't know wh what other conclusion you can come to because that they would be in this state, we understand. That we're talking about staying in that state, yeah. see? Just as surely as Christ s staying in you, that's, that's a secret. If that can happen, instability will result, we understand. But God has made this rather 
tender type thing. So that the Holy Spirit, who is very sensitive, you can grieve him, you can quench him, you can resist him. And if you do, this whole thing falls to the ground. Can't be sustained. And why did God do it that way? God will not let a person, any person, be saved without himself being primary in the project. Amen. That's why it's this way. God's showing people man can't save himself. If man could save himself, we don't need Jesus. We don't need any of this. But man can't. But see, this is a very difficult lesson for men to learn. They continue to think they can. If, it, if you just tell us what we should do, we can do it. But they overlook the fact that God tells people what to do and if you think the law was hard to do think about what you're required to do in Christ be steadfast and unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord see all of us now we've been called even to a higher plateau and so it's arranged this way so it won't work unless God's involved and God will not be involved unless faith is present, and faith will not be present unless Christ is indwelling, and Christ will not be indwelling unless you're made strong. <laughs> See, And all of this whole thing, you step back and look at it like a panoramic vision. You step back and look at it, and that's, how, that's what the angels are seeing. Right. This whole, right. that here's where what God started with, but bless God, look what he's ending with. Amen. And that Wisdom is, <laughs> is written across that line. Yeah. Now, see, everything in salvation <laughs> is owing to participation in the divine nature. By, by the exceeding great and precious promises of God, we partake <coughs> or participate in the divine nature. Or right, that participation is he brings a microscope down on it here. Partic that we partake of Christ, we partake of the divine nature. He puts a microscope to that, and you see that that involves, oh, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. See, that's one of the components. Christ dwell in your heart by faith. See, that's another component. Rooted and grounded, that's another component. So that's what he's doing. See, he's, he talks about the grand pole of the thing, then he breaks it down and shows you how that thought and design and intent is associated with this whole thing from beginning to end. Uh, one, one final thing, rooted and grounded in love. Well, what's he talking about? Is he talking about the love for the world, love for the lost, or love of the brethren, or love of the word, or? What's he talking about? All right, he's talking about God's love, about, be more particular, about your perception of God's love. That this whole thing of salvation has been driven by the magnanimous nature of God. He wants to bless. Yes. Yeah. Amen. He loves with an exceeding manner of love and as you see it you like you like join in <laughs> you like join in the work oh you don't want to offend God like this you don't want God to be provoked because of your response to this this is how it affects you so much so that we love him because he first loved us. There's an expression of rooted and grounded in love. There's an ex there's an expression that depicts depicts that. Christ is said to have also loved the church, and gave himself for it. But he wants the church to see it, he wants them to know it. The idea is that salvation itself is rooted in God's love. See, salvation is an expression of God's love. Right. 
so that God, God Himself, His salvation is rooted in the love. So if you if you see it like it really is, it'll root you too. Amen. See, That's, it'll root and ground you too. You become stable. That was remember how David he'd have these expressions about, "Oh how I love I thy Lord." Day and night courts is as a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord and a drill in tents of witness. What was all that? That was he saw God's love for him. That produced this response. So as we present salvation, it's got to be presented as salvation is an expression of God's love. The great lover, with he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's different than saying God loves everybody. Yeah, right. A whole lot different. Here is saying God did something yeah. about the condition, and he did it because he wanted to do it. And if you see this and you get hold of it, you want to be a part of it. Yeah. That's how it works. Amen. And so Paul's praying that, all of that would happen. He knows that if growing never ceases in the believer, falling is the next thing on the agenda. And if he knows also that if the believer ever fails to see that this thing is driven by God's love, and he begins to think it's driven by fulfilling requirements, it's disastrous. Well, I've lived under the system. I... I know the effects it has. I did want to serve God. I really did. But I always, it was, it was hard work because I wasn't satisfied with what I was doing. I knew there's got to there's gotta be more and I'm, I'm not anywhere near where I ought to be and it's how you think. But Paul is teaching the people to think, when you think about security and about God finishing the work, and God bringing you all the way home through Christ, at some point you have to think about what God's doing. And as you do, that will address what you do. And it'll do it effectively. And that, to me, that's what he's doing. It's brilliant. It's kingdom brilliance, <laughs> what he's doing. They were already in, see? They already went in. He could have said, well, you're in now. Go on your way rejoicing. No, he said, here's some people I can tell, I can tell them about this. Here's some people I can tell this to and divulge to them. And then and the angels and principles and powers will be impressed by how wise God is Amen. to make this out of people who are formerly dead in trespasses and sins. I think I'll close there. Any of you have something you'd like to add? Yes, Sister Barb. A very large work that Paul yeah. is being able to open up. But I was struck again with his specificity mm -hmm. yeah. about this. Usually when somebody mm -hmm. addresses something that's very large, it gets more general. Yeah, they, right. they, have, they express things in more generalities. And, yeah. But Paul does it. He was expounding Amen. the involvement of God in this work. Amen. Which I mm -hmm. see, as you as you alluded to, this in this is seeing the wisdom of God, that Paul was able to be so specific in his prayer for people yeah. to bring these truths to their attention. He could have mm -hmm. said, Lord, that you would bless them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he didn't. That's <laughs> he right. opened up yeah. the truth in his prayer for them. Amen. Amen. You were going to say something about the Bible? Yeah, yeah the, the angels, I was trying to think in my mind, if I could remember any scriptures where it talks about God loving the angels or God expressing <laughs> his love to the angels. But yet in salvation, they're witnessing a love that's manifested itself yeah. in bringing those that were enemies of God yeah. to actually to be in His presence, and yeah. God's going to dwell in them. And this manifestation of the love of God, they're seeing it from a unique perspective. Yeah, I don't, I don't question that He loves them, but it, it's a different kind of. Uh -huh. They're His ministers, so He made them His ministers, but it's a different kind of association than. Than we have, yeah. yeah. So much so that it, there's a sense in which it's superior, yeah. because that's why they desire to look into right. these things. See, oh, amen. <laughs> what is man if thou art mindful of him? That's uh -huh. it. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's what he's answering. He's answering the question here. <laughs> All right. 